Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to a special Fatigue Index on Anfield Index. We're going to be uh, looking at doping in football in this one. It was a, a conversation kind of triggered by an article written by Nick and um, Edmund Wilson, Williams, Willison for the uh, Mail on Sunday about um, some doping, the testing in the Premier League Football League. Um, we've got three special guests. We've got Nick. Who was half writing the article and researching it? He's writes for the Mail on Sundays, went for the Independent, the Sunday Times. He also runs the uh, excellent sporting intelligence website. It's something I've read for years. Um, we're also joined by Cy Brundish. Everyone who listens to Anfield Index will know Cy from the Under Pressure podcast and um, behind the Fatigue Index as well. Um, he's worked for various um, football teams, including the Ladies Derby winning team this season um, and England under 21s he also runs UK Strength Lab um, his Twitter feed is excellent for anyone who's not seen him both in fact uh, well, I, well Nick calls himself reassuringly grumpy on his Twitter feed and I think I can say the same <laughs> about sad at times um, and then we're also joined by Professor Ross Tucker who's a, a leader in his field um, he is the Science of Sport on Twitter and run and is part of the uh, Science of Sport podcast. You must listen to that one. It's excellent. So, Nick, let's start Hello. with you. Um, can you just give us a quick summary of the investigations that you did for this article um, and, you know, and how, how that started? I'm also interested in what you did to, ca- to get the information. Okay. So I am Chief Sports News Correspondent at the Mail on Sunday, as well as owning and editing sportingintelligence.com. I've worked in national newspapers for 25 years. I cover investigative stuff, whether that's FIFA corruption or doping or all sorts of related issues that would come under that umbrella. Um, So I've been covering doping in sport for a long time way back when I was at the independent in 1998 the year of the Festina tour de France the infamous Festina tour where um, the extent to which performance enhancing drugs uh, in cycling became n- no longer um, a, a secret but a widespread established fact that the majority of the peloton were on EPO and all sorts of other things um, way back then we at the independent did a huge survey of of sports, British sports people um, across all sorts of sports, football, cricket, boxing, horse riding, where we sent out thousands of questionnaires and had quite a good response. One of the only sports that actually refused to take part was uh, cycling, British cycling, which was in itself quite interesting. But we spoke to weightlifters. So so we looked at uh, that. We did that back then. That also included football. I've done other surveys over the years with the PFA, including asking footballers about their experiences of, of recreational drugs, uh, not recreational drugs, drugs, including recreational drugs and performance enhancing drugs. These are the kind of studies that have also been done, um, you know, by the BMJ over the, over the years. Um, uh, in terms of big, big doping stories, it was myself and a colleague at the Mail on Sunday, Martha Kellner, who in 2013 revealed that Russia, there was a state sponsored doping um, scheme being run by an, a then unknown Moscow laboratory boss called Grigory Rodchenkov. Um, uh, and then uh, we, we said in that piece that, that this, this was going on and that the Sochi Olympics would be completely corrupted by this scheme. We told the IOC, they completely ignored us. It all went ahead exactly as we said it would. Um, we followed that up with lots of stuff about doping in Russian football as part of the state-sponsored doping scheme in the run-up to the 2018 World Cup, including giving lots of stuff to FIFA. They completely ignored us. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so, so there's big, you know, hundreds and hundreds of articles about and investigations into some of the biggest names in sport, some of whom we've actually been able to name, most of whom we haven't been able to. Um, so this current piece, the piece that we ran a few weeks ago, which was Ed Willison principally, and obviously me helping him because we've, we've worked together on lots of things over the last few years. Um, we Our interest was piqued by a positive finding in the Premier League for a substance called uh, HCG in the second half of the 2019 20 20 season and a sportsman can test positive for this as a result of a tumor such as testicular cancer and so it it should be able to be ruled out quickly a sort of a, a um an innocent explanation so we followed this case we were asking who is this footballer who is this premier league footballer what was happening we asked about it at the time we didn't get answers an investigation went on for at least five months an active investigation we don't know the player's identity we don't know the club we don't know there was no apparently obvious or quick innocent explanation but we spent quite a lot of time without ever writing anything about it because we couldn't find information about about that case um another case um in october 29 a 15 year old boy registered to a premier league club was found with a banned human growth hormone dispensing pen and ended up being banned uh, wow. for nine months, you know, for taking this performance enhancing drug, which is perhaps most famously benefited the career of Lionel Messi. Um, so that there were these cases, um, so in effect, what we did, to cut a long story short, we we asked the relevant bodies, i.e. UCAD, and they, together with the FA, we wanted to know about positive drugs tests um, for all drugs, performance enhancing and recreational uh, since 2000 and uh, was it, I think it was 2013 we asked for the, basically the last 10 years 10 years of data and um, what we got back from UCAD was um, details of 39 positive drug tests and what had happened as a result i.e were there any punishments or not um, in the period between 2015 to 2020, inclusive those six years, uh, there were 15 Premier League players amongst the 39 cases who tested positive for things varying from amphetamine to triamcinolone, morphine, Ritalin or ADHD medicines, um, and masking agents, uh, prednisone and other steroids. And none of them were sanctioned. And there were 24 non-Premier League players um, and 15 of them were sanctioned for between 20 weeks and four years for uh, substances ranging from nandrolone to uh, uh, recreational drugs such as cannabis and cocaine. The other 49 cases, so there were, um, what it was, 88 cases in the period. The other 49 cases, they told us they were not able to provide information on what had happened with those for various reasons, and they weren't broken down into which cases fell into which category but the reasons given were one um, a number of cases were done under the fa's separate testing program for rec specifically for recreational drugs which uh, tries to obviously catch predominantly young players who might be dabbling with cannabis or coke or something and they tend to get a slap on the wrist or a short ban and it's dealt with privately and it's considered a health issue so there's quite a lot of that going on the fa is not under any obligation to do this testing but does it as they say as a social sort of part of their social responsibility. Um, so some of those 49 were not given to us for those reasons. Some of the 49 were not given to us for reasons of unspecified medical confidentiality, uh, whatever that may be. Again, you know, that a whole gamut of, of substances could have, could have come up in that category for reasons that we can only speculate about. So we don't know. And the third sort of most curious thing was they couldn't give us details for some of those 49 cases for reasons of operational, um, I can't remember the exact phrase, but basically operational reasons relating to UCAD investigations. So in other words, could there be cases in there of performance enhancing drugs, which um, if they would be to reveal to us would perhaps suggest that UCAD had ongoing investigations into performance enhancing drugs in football. We don't know because they wouldn't tell us. So with all of these things, as ever, you know, you're limited by the information that you can have. But within the context of, of, of looking at uh, these specific cases and these 39 cases that we knew about and these 15 Premier League players, 
of whom I think 12 of them were substances which you would broadly say would fall into the performance enhancing area. Uh, we just published the findings and explained the methodology and how we did it. It should have taken 20 working days for UCAD to respond to a freedom of information request. It took 60 working days. Um, and it just adds to the to our interest in exploring this area, which is something, as I said, that I've been following for, for decades. Um, and in the context of global football, the idea that there is no place for performance enhancing drugs, there is just, there's no use. Performance enhancing drugs fulfill no function in football is clearly a nonsense. I mean, this is the kind of thing that Gordon Taylor of the PFA and Seth Blatter used to trot out. Um, but you, we, we know from multiple cases, multiple studies, academic works down the year, which I'm quite happy to go into, whether it's the BMJ study from 2005 or the, the footballer from much more recently who, who asked colleagues, more than 100 colleagues across uh, Germany, Sweden and, and Spain and had quite alarming levels of emissions of performance enhancing drug use, whether it's the scandals in Italy around Juventus or Arsene Wenger saying that private blood testing at Arsenal um, was showing that they were signing players um, who, who it strongly appeared to have been taking EPO uh, to umpteen other examples, whether it's TUEs for footballers, as revealed by Fancy Bears. Clearly, there are performance enhancing drugs being used in football. And I think the only issue is how widespread is this? And of course, as a journalist, what can we do to try and get to the bottom of it? I know that yeah. was going on a bit, but that's the nutshell of what we sort of found. Um. Okay, so let's come on to, and there's a couple of points I wanted to come back with Nick, but first of all, so what, what would your objections be then to these findings or is it how it was reported or are you of the view that performance of vendor drugs can improve football performance? You know, does it give them the incentive to take them? Um, what are they? I had two immediate responses to this. Firstly, the numbers involved so so let me set aside for a second i think nick is a, a fantastic journalist and the way he approaches uh, investigative journalism is is wonderful and we need more of it in this world um in regards to this specific story i my, my immediate response was um that this number as a percentage of the people involved in football over the last seven years um, isn't a great number, is a very low um, percentage, and probably the story would be the opposite of the conclusion made. Um, that was literally my immediate response, uh, I, I, which uh, we, we devolved into uh, a, a, a social media conversation, let's say, um, which ended up doing this, which is I'm, I'm fascinated about, and uh, it's great to hear um, his insight in a much broader context and... Um, and all of the details involved, which is great. Um, I I would pose two questions. What, um, and Ross might be a, a, a great um, brain to resolve this. What would be the physiological um, barriers that footballers suffer performing at the highest level that can be improved by taking um, performance enhancing drugs? And what would those... Um, substances be and are we finding those and secondly I believe I, I nobody believes that the FA is more corrupt than me um, though that they pay me um, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying these things but um, I, there is corruption across all football no doubt my um, I find it really hard to believe that the Premier League, um, as currently constituted, could find a consensus amongst the clubs um, so deep that they would cover up these things. Uh, that, that anybody finding out that a player from Man United or Chelsea or City or Liverpool or Arsenal um, has tested positive and they're covering it up, there's no chance they wouldn't be all over it publicly. Can I come in? Yeah, sure. I don't think anyone's, I'm, I'm not suggesting the FA are corrupt at all, or that, or that anyone is covering up um, performance enhancing drugs in the Premier League. Um, I've never suggested that. So, but, but if, if you come to the, the question of, is the doping going on in football, including in the Premier League? Well, I gave you an example of a 15-year-old with a human growth hormone pen who, who was banned 
recently, you've got the 15 cases where there were no bans, presumably because they had TUEs or whatever. But the notion that there aren't drugs, performance enhancing drugs in pretty much every sport in every country, I think is, is well established. If you look at the prevalence of, I think, of all across all sports overall, you get a, roughly a 2% positive rate of, of drug tests. But, but the incidence of doping, as the WADA's famous studies in 2011 at Daegu and at the Asian Games, showed that the actual prevalence of performance enhancing drugs, albeit in track and field in this instance, is somewhere between 40 and 50%. So conventional drug testing captures perhaps fewer than one in 10 uh, sports people who are cheating. Um, so I'm not, you don't need to have a, a cover up for, for the doping to be going on. And on, on the flip side, equally, you can say, we just don't have the evidence to conclusively prove there's loads of performance enhancing drugs or even a minority of players using performance enhancing drugs in the Premier League. But the idea that drugs don't and can't assist footballers' performance, I think, um, is just not true. And I'm sure Ross can speak much, much more articulately and specifically about how drugs can, in fact, aid footballers, whether that's in recovery or stamina or oxygen carrying capacity. There you go, Ross. Um, it, what, is it possible? And what incentive has it got, as, as laid out by Sire with the massive um, wages involved, the money involved? Is that the incentive or would that not um, lead them more down a, a route of choosing that it would be too much of a risk because your, your career could be over? So one, have they got the incentive? And two, is it can, can there be performance enhancer drugs um, in football? Yeah, I mean, interesting set of questions. I think the, the incentive balance is determined on the one side by what is the benefit. And as you mentioned, selection is the main benefit being on the field because the consequence of that is the finance the downside is will i get caught and nick alluded to the relatively low likelihood that even comprehensive drug testing will catch a doper who is even vaguely sophisticated at doping so unfortunately the biggest problem facing anti-doping is that it doesn't deliver a large enough disincentive that's true i think of all sports and I think it's particularly the case in team sports because the volume of players who are, let's call them eligible dopers, <laughs> is so enormous. I mean, 20 Premier League teams that, uh, that have, I mean, what's the squad size? Probably 20 players, 25 players will play per year, but there's probably double that many in their squads. So over the course of a year, there are potentially a 1,000 players who need to be tested. And that's every day of the year. So when you start looking at the testing numbers and you see a claim made that there are 2,000 tests done, for example, in, in the Premier League players, that sounds large, but it's actually a very small proportion of, of the total candidate number of players. So the, the, the disincentive is quite small. Now, on the other side of that is what's the incentive? And I think it's interesting. It's arguably true that if I am a cyclist or a track and field athlete, a marathon runner, there is a straight line between doping and performance because if I use EPO to boost my oxygen carrying capacity, it literally makes me faster as a consequence of what I do in my, in my sporting activity. Similarly, if I'm a sprinter and I use testosterone, there's a straight line mediated by training because it's, it's not as though the drug makes me better. It's the training I do on it. I understand the argument that football is a little more complex because it is a multifactorial sport. There are many components to making a footballer good enough to play in the Premier League. But I think it's arguably true that if you, if you understand that the ability expressed by a footballer on the field is a function of their injury resistance, power, uh, potentially strength, upper body strength and lower body, ability to sustain high intensity running for 90 minutes with intervals in between all of these attributes would be potentially benefited from doping whether that is doping during a period of injury rehabilitation whether it's do doping during the pre-season and base phase of, of an upcoming season in order to improve strength and power so there's there's no doubt that the physiology of football does lend itself to performance enhancement but i do understand it's not 
it's not quite as straightforward as it is for running and swimming and cycling and speed skating. But I don't, I don't think one can make the argument that doping would be ineffective just because there's a technical component to football. So, I would, yeah, I would, I would also add, uh, uh, do you need to take drugs to be a brilliant footballer? Of course you don't. You could be, you know, we're not suggesting. I've never suggested that. The, 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 obviously, we had a, a social media exchange, Simon and I, where, where Simon sort of was very dismissive of, of the story and say, said that it was basically, uh, it, it was being done for clicks. Um, obviously, I hope you can appreciate it. it wasn't being done for clicks. It was something that, you know, I, I think is worth, worthy of examination. So, no, I don't think you need to take drugs. You don't need to take drugs to be a brilliant footballer. But certainly what Ross was talking about, in ter- specifically in terms of recovery, but, but yes, strength, upper body strength, lower body strength. There are drugs that you can take that would assist in certain aspects. And clearly this is a, a huge gray area and a massively underexplored area. Um, and that's why I think it is worth looking at it and having debates like this. Ty, do you want to come back on any of that? Sure. Um, so I... So we, we, right, if we uh, the thing I I still am questioning is what is the physiological change that we're hoping for, and because from Ross's perspective, we're looking we're looking here at, um, at Olympic events. They, they who wins those are limited by absolute maximal efforts of human performance. So you're pushing boundaries of physiological um, outputs. And if you input some uh, performance enhancing drug, which allows you to train longer, which allows you to recover a little bit better, which allows you generally to change the muscular structure uh, and tendon structure, which allows you then to be faster um, and then to expand on those naturally given um, human performance levels that I completely understand that. And uh, at 50%, uh, as, as Nick was saying, there's 50% of um, of those participants um, found by what uh, suggested by WADA that are probably doping. I get that completely. Football is submaximal, so we aren't pushing human performance limits anyway. So, what are the are the physiological adaptations we want to achieve? Is it are the people that are cheating? Um, just lazy people that can't be bothered to put the effort in. I'm not convinced by, um, with respect to Ross, the strength ga- gains because footballers don't train enough for, for uh, strength development. And there's a real cultural issue within football that is slightly changing about the right appropriate size and shape of a footballer um, and whether they should what we look at uh, historically, Jordan Henderson would be a really good shape for a, uh, a footballer and perhaps a Dharma Traore might be the opposite end of a, um, that, that physical spectrum um, of a big, strong, fast unit that, uh, that can lift lots of weights, His has a really big, powerful upper body, which theoretically um, will enable him to be more, more robust and stay on the pitch longer, but actually doesn't get borne out in, in, um, in his availability numbers. Um, but then you look at Mo Salah, who is always available and is absolutely jacked. So um, potentially you could say you, somebody like Mo Salah and watching his physical transformation over the last six or seven years, maybe he's doping. But is he is his body even transformed in a way that isn't um, absolutely possible with a bit of extra strength training? So is is, your, is, it, is what you're saying the only argument for the incentive is to get on the pitch more is to is to get but what, what, what recover, from injury like quicker, recover from injury quicker which which point is it well i would say it's all all of the above right but i just just on that there are some studies and i'm sure simon would be more familiar with them it's it's his area of expertise but there are some studies that do suggest that fatigue is a factor in football so For instance, the distance run and the high-speed running meters in the second half are slightly lower than in the first half in a couple of studies. It's been shown that in 92, when the Premier League was inaugurated over the course of the next few years, the the distances run, particularly high-speed running, did increase. And that's been suggested to be a consequence of more sophisticated preparation methods. But I would argue that any activity where fatigue occurs 
stands to benefit from the reduction of fatigue. I'm, I'm, I hope that that feels logical. And so if you can, if you can take football and say that we can, we can raise your ceiling, your physiological capacity by 5%, it means that you can do the same task 5% easier, relatively speaking. And that means that you will perform better because either you can increase the intensity slightly before you bump up against that ceiling or you can meet the match demands. Because this is, I think, an important point is that in, in, in football, the physical demand is set to some degree by the tactical demand, right? So a coach who wants players to execute a high press might be asking those players to do something quite different to, to a coach who doesn't. And I suspect that the ability to meet those demands would be improved, not necessarily by more muscle mass, not necessarily by more oxygen capacity, at carrying capacity, but by a combination of those things. I, I, it, it, it seems implausible to me to suggest that because they don't train enough, they wouldn't benefit from doping. If anything, I would say that if there's a culture of not doing more training, it actually opens the door to more doping because you can achieve the same outcome with less investment. Uh, and then, of course, injury rehabilitation and prevention would be crucial because we know that many doping products are recovery aids. So growth hormone, testosterone, many of the um, corticosteroids would accelerate recovery after injury and therefore return to play sooner. So I, I just think that combination makes it likely that there is a place for doping. As Nick said, that doesn't mean that to succeed, you have to be a doper because there are many different ways to succeed in football. But arguably, in the search for some advantage, there would be players and coaches who would look at doping as a way to unlock them. Can I make a, two, two quick points? One is, and I know we all know this because it's just absolutely obvious, but I've never suggested and none of us will suggest that there is a pill that you take at 10 o'clock in the morning that makes you run quicker at five past 10 or that you can suddenly take a pill and you'll be able to lift, you know, bench press 200 kilos, whereas before you couldn't. I think it is worth reiterating that, that actually most dopers take drugs to allow them to train hard or to, or to, or to train less hard, but to get more benefit as, 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 as um, Ross said. So it's not about a magic pill, it's about recovery, it's about training hard, about increasing your capacity for hard work and muscle building or whatever, that's one thing. And secondly, I'm not suggesting at all that there is a big doping problem in the Premier League or indeed in football. By big, I mean, I'm not suggesting that doping would be anywhere as near as prevalent in football as it was say in the EPO era in cycling where you had conservatively 75% of the peloton, at least on EPO and other things. However, studies have shown, and this is, you know, credible academic surveys of footballers have shown that footballers themselves say there is doping within their sport. There was a, a BMJ study in 2005 where 6% of respondents indicated that they personally knew players who used performance enhancing drugs. And these were spread across, this is English football, 18% um, of, the, of those who, who said they knew of, of drugs were playing in Premier League and 24% in Division 1 as it then was, 36% in the second division, 21% in the third division. So that is a study of English footballers, what, 15 years, 16 years ago, where, where a small percentage are saying they know people to be using performance enhancing drugs. And again, an interesting one, which, you know, I'll actually go back to this at some point, but in 2016, a footballer, former footballer turned academic, a German Moroccan named Lofty El Basidi, published research signings based on interviews with players, players that he knew and had played with. He, he, his journeyman career began in the mines reserves in Germany in the late 1990s and ended in Spain's third tier in 2010. And several times he was given supplements or IV treatments, not knowing what they contained. And he was drug tested once in his career ever all of which made him curious about drugs in football. And so he had 124 responses, a small sample size, yes, but these were from football contact, footballer contacts he knew personally across Germany, Spain and Sweden um, about their experiences and concluded between 40 and 30% of players had doped in the previous year with the lowest rates in Sweden and the highest in Spain, which I think most of us can accept that Spain as a sports culture has got lots of question marks over um over doping within spanish sport whether that's Absolutely. cycling or 
over Olympic sports. So those are two surveys right there with footballers saying they know about performance enhancing drugs. And it is, it's frustrating as a journalist that this is such a, still such an unexplored area. And of course, again, I think that's why it's interesting for us to discuss it. So you've got lots of contacts. I've spoke to lots of people. What, what's been your experience? And, and you've seen the processes that go on. Um, just trying to get footballers on the field more often. After back- my um, after the conversation that Nick and I had last week, I've spoken to more than 30 uh, practitioners that work in it, either in the Premier League or in international football. And so in that small s- survey, equal, I, I would suggest it's a similar kind of survey to, to uh, your Moroccan dude. Um, and uh, across the board, um, there they all responded with there's no doping going on here um or or sarcastic i fall over needles every day in the changing room um the, if you from an operational perspective if you go into a changing room and try to have conversations about supplements about um the supplements that the uh, footballers should be using and the labeling that they should be looking for the vast majority will have no idea what what is banned and what isn't banned despite repeated presentations of of um of passing on this information and guiding them towards the good supplements there i'm not in any way suggesting that uh, players don't take supplements because they all have mates who say uh take this uh, it's a good thing um and it's 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 possible that that they will be taking some kind of supplement off the internet for for creating or um it's some kind of protein more likely because that's what they should should be should be uh, taking uh, to support their recovery and there is possible trace elements in in there or or there is very possible that they're just taking something they shouldn't without meaning for it to be uh, any in any way contravening rules um i i just don't find any evidence from really delving down i was fully holding myself to to my toes to the fire after our conversation to see if i i really spoke out and, and thought i was um i'm fully uh, accepting of being totally wrong on this and none of the practitioners that i'd spoken to said um that they had caught any case do you think if if they had, they would say, oh, yeah, I've been giving um, steroids to players for years or using Triumcin alone, um, you know, in knee injuries when we've had to say it was asthma. Do you think they, and a genuine question, if somebody had been doing something that they thought was close to the line or, or knew someone who did, what, what is their incentive for telling you that they've been breaking the rules? In conversations that I've had over the years with lots of practitioners I've known for 10, 20 years, um, there is stuff that's that's close to the knuckle um, that gets talked about all the time. That I, I could tell you a, a dozen stories of illegal behaviour of, of uh, people around football that gets talked about. Um, f- practitioners move within clubs, between clubs all the time, because that's the nature of, of football. Nobody has a job for more than three years. I could tell you the five people in the country that have worked for their club for more than three years. Um, and so they're they're moving into a, a totally new environment. They would they would absolutely call out whatever practitioner had been involved before doing something shady. Um, there is there is conversations about um, less scrupulous behaviour, um, but without stuff actually being formally illegal or banned. Uh, so I don't know why they wouldn't stump up to me and say this I, the, the, a lot of the people that I spoke to would have made would have had uh, great joy in in poking a hole in my argument I promise you yeah do, do you think there's a case that individual footballers with their with individual whatever personal trainers doctors advisors yes could, could be could be being given stuff that 100 i think that's absolutely possible and that that probably does deserve some some uh investigation and because, go yeah, on. Go on. well i i it still i would still like to to uh with ross's help to to um if i were going to improve a footballer's performance and my training wasn't good enough to get that to change physiologically that that player to do 
um, to have the kind of outputs on the field in high speed running. To, they, they currently, they've, you were taught, you cited, Ross cited a study from uh, 2005, it was actually 2007, um, that had uh, generally high speed running that was about uh, generally around 1700 meters per game. And then, and now in 2017, the last study was, but, ne- um, but if we actually look at stuff that I see now, it's getting on the, the uh, midfielders are getting onto around three, 3.2 um, kilometers of high speed running per game. If, if I see that that is a capacity of a footballer and they can't possibly do any more than that, and my training can't improve that, what would what would the the um, artificial agent be that I would give them to to get them beyond that limit? Does that make sense? Ross, it does. Uh, why can't they do more than that? That's my point. Why can't they do more than that? Struck that I don't see players not. So players wouldn't get picked if they weren't fulfilling the tactical role set laid out by the coach. Right. So if there if gaps were occurring during the game because a player wasn't fulfilling his role with with he didn't have the capacity to run back and fill this hole here or press in that that um, under that circumstance there, he wouldn't he would get dropped. But I, so you don't see that happening. But if if a ta- if a coach, if Bielsa decided that he needed uh, for his new tactical evolution, he needed players to be doing 4,000 meters per game of high speed running, because then that would impose a physical will on the opposition that they couldn't keep up with. What, what, what would we do to them if our training wasn't good enough to push that capacity? But just to take a step back, I mean, some would hear what you've just said and say that you've actually made an argument for doping in football because you've basically said that a coach wouldn't pick a player who can't fulfill the tactical obligations. And if that player could improve their, their fitness for, that's a generic catch-all term. I, I wish I had a better term for it, but I th- hopefully you know what I mean. Yeah, strength that, and everything. That, that, player would, um, that, that player would arguably stand to benefit from an improvement in, let's say, VO2 max, uh, recovery ability between maximal sprints and therefore the ability to, to meet that target of 3,200 meters high-speed running per game. So have you not just made an argument that could be used to support the need for doping to increase physiological capacity? I think what Simon is asking, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is which drug, which specific drug can he give his players to help them get beyond their maximal natural capacity, for want of a better phrase? Yeah, sure. So, so again, bearing in mind what, what Simon accurately said earlier, it's a function of training. The answer would be that you could, uh, you could use EPO and blood doping methods, and, and you probably would have seen that there has been speculation about that in the past. I think Italy, France, Spain, many of the athletes in the uh, Puerto scandal were alleged to be footballers. We'll never know, thanks to the courts. Um, then growth hormone and testosterone to improve recovery because, and again, Simon's the expert on this. I don't know how much a footballer trains, but if that can be increased by 10%, then those drugs have start to become beneficial for recovery, not necessarily muscle development. Um, and then the third one would be corticosteroids because you can reduce inflammation, which allows the training ceiling to be raised. The athlete can then do slightly more. We know that corticosteroids have benefits instantly or acutely in cycling performance. So I don't see why they wouldn't also have benefits in football. Can, can I draw up a, a training week for you? So, so people listening to this will understand how the training week works. Sure. Yeah. Um, so say, so what would be interesting for Nick, I think, is if, if his... Uh, investigation would set around I I, I get completely that there is a a possibility of some kind of recovery element involved Um, but I would also imagine that it would have to be done on a larger scale if it was going to be a a greatly significant benefit for any team but the the top teams in the the Premier League so uh, the top four, top six that have to play repeatedly a game every 3.2 days over the course of most of of the season which mm, uh, extrapolate to about 32 weeks long um, that those players play Saturday they will have uh, match day plus one 
plus two, which are just recovery days. So theoretically, you could improve the speed of their recovery. And then game day plus three, they start, they should theoretically start to uh, load with more training. But then there's game day plus four, which is, which is getting to the day where your body physiologically is fully recovered, but is actually another game. So that you need them to recover more quickly so that they can play again or on that get game day plus four would be a high training day but is at the top level is actually a playing day so playing training that's just a it's just semantics really it's the same thing um and then that just repeats throughout the season but everybody from um five down in the premier league play once a week so they have game they have match day plus one all the way game day plus four uh, then turns into uh, match day minus two, which is purely tactical preparation. Match day minus one, which will be a couple of sprints in there just to make sure they've got enough um, exposure to high speed running so they don't tear anything when they're, when they're expected of it in a, in a match. And over the course of that week, they will do the amount of, of high speed running and sprinting and total distance twice um, what's expected of them in a, in a, in a match. So if it's if say if their average player is running 10k, they will run they will cover 20k during the whole training week. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they're tracking all I'm this not... out. They're tracking all this on a on a <laughs> daily basis with all the players. Yeah. Oh, totally. So, so they're totally tracking this with GPS, but they're also to- totally tracking the physiological responses of the players through um, force testing, through um, neurological. Uh, responses and uh, what we call HRV, uh, heart rate variability. So each player has their own uh, normative levels and they get checked every day on where they are in relation to that normal level so they can see when they're ready to be exposed to higher training again. So one, I can't see how one massive group of footballers are pushed beyond limits so that they have to train harder. Because I, I don't know if they're training as hard as they possibly can anyway. Does that make sense? So hypothetically, Sai, si, you're, you're saying because they've got two rest days after a game, you're not seeing any clubs that are just having one rest day and then extra training, so they're getting the extra capacity from the... Yeah, from, so they don't, they don't the, need a drug so they can train people. more. They're already not training hard enough. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd argue that they're training as hard as the schedule allows, no? so they need full recovery that's it so so what my my question would be are they would they be taking uh some kind of uh aid which will get rid of one of the training one of the rest days which will, will enable them to train an extra day yeah I, be, I hear that I, I suppose the way that you've described it now and, and 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 i certainly believe that that is the case it's just one could interpret it to say that the schedule is so demanding and there's just a little time for recovery to be achieved while at the same time training, that they are pretty close to the limit. So if one argues that in a match, they are pretty close to their physiological limits and their training week is close to what their schedule allows, then again, I would say some would argue that that creates the, the situation where doping would be valuable. So I would wonder what is the culture like in football around legal recovery? So for instance, icing and supplement use and so on. You alluded to supplements earlier. I saw very few studies documenting properly what supplement use is in football, but that it is in the range of between 40 and 50%. So if, if there's a mindset towards performance enhancement and particularly recovery enhancement in football, in part, large part, because of the constraints, both physical and time that you've just explained some would look at that and say well that's exactly the situation doping would benefit i i can see that that's why i said i literally in a in our twitter discussion i i even i even said to nick the only potential i see for this is some kind of recovery aid but then i would still see it would have to be team wide otherwise it would be you would one see some player from nowhere suddenly is fitter than everybody else that didn't used to be or so it would it would require some level of of uh, team-wide corruption 
Nick, well, this is a nice little point to move on because I would say from your investigation, you, you found that there were um, zero sanctions given to Premier League players. And as we know, the Premier League is its own entity. It's they're just all the individual teams. And then 63% of those from non-Premier League players were given sanctions. So one, what, what were your thoughts on why that is? And two, I don't know, is this a incentive from to, for the Premier League not to impose sanctions because there might be a lots of legal or borderline legal things that are going on? Well, there's two things. <clears throat> First of all, to say I made it clear in the in the thread, it kind of almost to to say, look, this is interesting, this is intriguing, but there was this there aren't smoking guns here, which is part of the problem. But when you looked at the 15 Premier League players and 12 of them arguably taking substances that arguably would enhance performance, whether that was amphetamines and triamcinolone or Ritalin or, or masking agents, then then um, you, the assumption has to be, again, not corruption within the Premier League, but one of two things. Either they came up with credible explanations and genuine reasons for needing triamcin alone, three different players, or, or steroids in the case of those testing positive for prednisone, that there were genuine reasons for that. That's one explanation. Another explanation could be that if you have enough money and enough legal clout then faced with an existential threat to your career and what would be a very lucrative livelihood perhaps you would push back more and be more capable of defending yourself uh, in the way that some very high profile athletes have done most recently say Tyson Fury in boxing where you end up ultimately I mean um, you know this is a gross simplification but Tyson Fury effectively could have bankrupted UCAD and UCAD uh, backed off So, and and again, I don't have evidence of that, but there is that disparity there between 15 drug cases, 12 of them performance enhancing and no sanctions, and 63% of the the cases outside the Premier League ended in sanctions. I, you know, we don't know because the transparency isn't there. We don't know the identities of the vast majority of these players. Some of the players in the Football League we do because, you know, we know their names and it became public once they were sanctioned that they were going to be banned for two years or four years for steroids or whatever it was. So I'm not suggesting corruption, um, but clearly a very rich footballer would have, you know, greater greater means to, to fight um, legally against, against things. And they, they would also have greater access to expertise that could say they absolutely needed that triumph sin alone because they've got terrible hay fever. Um, you know in in terms of the again I agree with Simon I think you would need and again it's not being suggested that sort of doping programs going on at individual clubs I'm not suggesting that at all as I've said before I think you're looking at a small a small minority of players are, are using and telling researchers that they're using performance enhancing drugs so it doesn't necessarily have to be on a club by club basis and I actually think Uh, it would mitigate it against it happening in a systematic fashion because conspiracies tend not to hold. Um, But then again, you have got, we could go into the details of what happened at Juventus, what happened or whatever, what happened in Russia. Let me give you this one example, because this is a case I know firsthand. Rodchenkov, the corrupt lab boss, who I got to know after he fled uh, to America um, and is now under uh, witness protection and 24-hour FBI protection, you know, in fear of his life because Putin would like him dead. He was telling me about a, a doctor called Sergei Pukov, who was a former head of medicine um, at Zenit St. Petersburg. He was also, according to Rodchenkov, an archetypal witch doctor in football with very good practical experience of doping sports pe- people, having been a Russian Olympic doctor. So Pukov was Zenit's doctor from 20, 2006 to 2017. And um, their medical practices raised eyebrows in 2014 when they were described by the late Dutch footballer Fernando Rickson in his autobiography, saying there were, and I quote, needles and syringes all over the place. And I quote, players hooked up to drips. Rickson said Pukov offered him injections and he accepted them again and again and again. And he wrote in his book, I didn't have a clue what Dr. Pukov was putting in me, but man, it worked. I got an energy boost, which was beyond imagination. Nobody ever tested positive. Pukov, I kept telling myself, must know the boundaries. After all, the man had been the official doctor of the Russia Olympic team. I mean, this is, um, you know, that that's a fairly extraordinary testimony to a player who was at a club where that sort of thing was going on in, you know, five years ago. 
Um, I just, I, just to bring Ross in, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested in why and some wider context on different sporting organisations. Do you think maybe the Premier League might evolve to be stricter? Um, is, is it going to take time because there hasn't been the volume of testing that they've got in other sporting organisations? You've got the, the cycling and the IOC, you know. Um, they seem to have higher volumes for, the, for those activities. What is it? Could, is it the Premier League? Can they evolve? Or do you think because of their own organisation, it's very unlikely they might need some greater investigations to find anything? Well, I think a couple of things. Number one is um, anti-doping very much requires investigation these days. Nick will testify as being one of the people who's done that, but it seems quite rare that anti-doping testing is the thing that breaks open a doping scandal. More often than not, it's investigative work. So if there was... A whistleblower a, type stuff, the whistleblower type things rather than it, testing. Exactly that, exactly that. So if there was... If there was truly an appetite, and this is all sport, not, not just football, if there was truly an appetite to combat anti-doping, they would invest as much in investigations as they do in testing. That said, f- football actually does do, uh, as, as, as I've read it, looking up ahead of this podcast, the, the most testing by volume of the sport, certainly in the UK. Um, you know, UK anti-doping does that testing on, on behalf of the football league and their numbers show, and I think this is the case even globally. People can look up WADA's testing numbers, and you'll discover that there is quite a lot of testing in football, but that doesn't tell you the whole story. The problem is that there are many, many more footballers as well. So as I alluded to earlier, the proportion of players who are likely to be tested per year might be comparatively low relative to, say, cycling, where there may be fewer tests, but a lot fewer cyclists. So I've, not, I've never really seen anyone do a systematic analysis that looks at how many athletes should be tested as opposed to how many athletes actually are tested across the different sports. There were articles that I found talking about how there was intent from the FA to increase the testing numbers over time, and that's obviously a good thing. But I also wonder about the type of testing that's done. We know now that urine testing is the easiest one for the doper to avoid being caught by. Because if you just manage your dosage and your timing, the urine testing is largely ineffective. So it needs more blood testing and it specifically needs a passport. Now, there's as yet no reliable passport for anything other than blood doping, which is certainly the purview of endurance athletes. So there are definitely gaps in the testing process and authorities that rely only on testing are relying on an imperfect tool in inadequate numbers. And so it really does require investigation. And that's why, and again, I, I feel that we probably agree more than we disagree on this debate. And yeah. we're at risk of polarizing it to the extent of saying there's no doping in football or everyone dopes. And I don't think anyone on this panel no, no. is on either extreme there. So I just think the more questions are asked, the more scrutiny is, the better, because you'll either find something or nothing. And either way, you're better off. Yeah, I've actually got some numbers on the testing from a piece of work we did back in. Sporting intelligence for from the start till the um, pandemic sort of uh, wreaked havoc on sport in 2020, we did 10 versions of the Global Sports Salary Survey, which people can get by going on Sporting Intelligence website or going on the microsites, uh, Global Sports Salaries um, surveys, or, or just ask me on Twitter and I'll point you to them. In 2017, we did a gender equality themed issue, which, which led to me counting the number of football, professional footballers in the world. Um, which was quite a task in itself. This was to sort of quantify that uh, the, the headline finding was nothing to do with drugs. It was to do with the fact that for every um, one female professional footballer in the world, there were 100 men. And uh, the average footballer in the world earns 100 times more than the average female professional. But the bottom line is it led me to counting the number of professional footballers. There are about 140,000 professional footballers in the world and about 40,000 drug tests in football worldwide each year, not all of them in the professional game. So on average, roughly and globally, a footballer gets tested once every three and a half years. Mm. That's where testing is globally. Mm. It's obviously more intense in the higher profile leagues, the big five leagues of Europe, and obviously within the Premier League, I think it's two players per match get tested. And there's some out of competition testing. Um, but a lot two, of- two players from each team. 
Yeah, and so that's so that that so, you know that that's a body of testing. But actually, I think a lot of the testing uh, in Britain is done, you know, under the auspices of the FA's recreational testing thing, as opposed to seeking in competition, whatever. So, so yeah, the Premier League will get tested more than most, but the headline figure is a footballer gets tested once every three and a half years, which is not a lot. No, and that's so. So what we're saying is there is a quite a, a high volume of tests going on, but a really tiny portion of players getting tested and there needs to be a huge increase in the frequency and proportion then if we are to find anything yeah but also i mean ross and i've both sort of said this i think investigation is probably a much better tool but it's it, it's time consuming it's expensive i mean conventional drug testing particularly of urine is as close to useless as possible in unearthing drug taking as it could be without actually being useless you're catching in some sports, one in 25 dopers. So it's, it's not a very effective tool. Investigation is an effective tool. And you can see particularly, I'm trying to think of a governing body, probably um, World Athletics, used to be um, IAAF, now World Athletics. They, you know, they've got quite an impressive investigative unit working basically like investigative journalists, but, you know, former police officers and people following intelligence and tip-offs but it's it's long hard work and in the end when you get you know busts they tend to be pretty spectacular but you know you can spend a lot of time in Kenya or Ethiopia and following people around and following intelligence leads before you actually bust the particular hotel where the coach has got all the EPO in a fridge at the same time the athletes are there I mean these things do happen but if I were if I were policing sport, I would definitely be um, I would definitely sort of change uh, change the emphasis to investigative led, um, encourage whistleblowing, incentivize whistleblowing. Um, if you if if you're serious about actually finding dopers and kicking them out, and unfortunately most people are not serious because there's not really an incentive. What what sports team? What governing body? What individual wants doping? to be rooted out, really? And the answer is not very many. So I would, like, uh, you've, you've said on a few occasions, and I know there's a huge disparity between wages between the bottom of the Football League and the top of the Premier League, but you tell us all the time that footballers are huge talkers as well, like sports scientists that are always talking to each other about stuff. Would, would it, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it means they don't have an incentive to say this, but they move clubs just as often. So why haven't we had the dynamic for whistleblowers to come out? Footballers generally don't tell on each other. That's one of the things. I, I can I can I add a layer of the stuff I was yep. talking about to to the um, the coaches that work in football over the last week. Is that that basically the consensus was at the Premier League level, at the elite level, that they don't see anything. But if there was any doping going on on any kind of level, it would be done at the lower leagues with people incentivized by staying in the game and trying to make money because they make so little money. The difference between them playing or not is the difference of whether they can keep their house. And and I think it's grossly undervalued how much that is a it plays a role in, in English football in particular. Anything, the championship, there are players in the championship that are earning 50 grand a year and less than 50 grand a year. Um, and then as soon as you drop below that, they're, they're basically, um, they're working in supermarket money. And that's, that's for a four or five year period. So anything they can do to stay in the game. And as Nick pointed out, that there's no testing at that level. So they can basically do whatever they want. That's why I was trying to get to Ross. What, what would, if, if Nick wanted somebody to be uh, creating a, a drug testing protocol, what would that battery look like? And and we've only while well, I'm going on here, we've only really talked about football as uh, the male sport. And Nick just in- introduced the the female um, part of the sport from a financial perspective. But what I just mentioned about the lower leagues that is absolutely applicable to the to the women's game. And a whole extra context of this is that um, we talked about three and uh, three point two. Uh, K of high speed running uh, basically there was a 40% increase over over a 10 year period in football there's a 60% increase in the last 5 years in women's football the athleticism is the total game changer in women's football because it's traditionally been run by been played by women that aren't 
the most athletic people in their school in their towns and it's grad and so if if the players that ended up playing football were happened to be the fast um, girl, they had such a big advantage. So that gap of athleticism is gradually, clo- well, it's not gradually, over the last five years, it's rapidly closing. The ones in the academies now are much more athletic and similar um, of, from a physiological perspective to, to what you'd see in a boys' football. Um, but the, so athletic, um, you, it, it, your athleticism is a huge barrier to entry of women's football that it isn't in boys'. So I, I would say that there's probably more incentive for doping in girls football, given that it's also never tested. Ross? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, uh, the same arguments I have heard been made about rugby is that the problem will exist below the very pinnacle level of the sport. I'm not sure I agree necessarily in an absolute terms, but I, I think relatively it, it most likely is the case. Yes. I still think if, any any situation you're in where you have humans at or near the limit, there will be an incentive and a benefit from doping. So what Simon's saying there is that for in, in women, because of the, the, let's call it the maturation of the sport and the relative benefit of athleticism, that incentive is stronger. But I don't think it may, that necessarily makes it zero in the men's game. I Maybe one would argue, I mean, Simon, would you... Would you say that there's no benefit to athleticism in the men's game? I don't think you're saying that, right? No, not at all. I'm saying in, in men's football, there's a study that was put out a couple of weeks ago, uh, tracking academy players, uh, tested at nine and then tested at 18. So a big longitudinal study. And the only correlation in physical testing of who was still in football at 18 that were, it, that were tested at nine was 30 meter speed. So there was an absolute barrier to entry uh, in football. But the difference is the demographic that is playing football on a massive scale are fast and there are, and it's absolutely abundant in girls football the um that there is no speed barrier to entry if there is somebody that's fast they are great players but most of them aren't so mm. if you can make yourself faster then you're going to get a lot more money is that not equally true in men's sport though in generally, but also in, in particularly in football, if there are 140,000 places available in the professional game around the world, and I don't know, 700 of them in premiership in England, there are 100 people who want each of those one spots. You know, it's musical chairs. And if I can get 2% better than my rivals, then that means I get that chair someone else doesn't. So again, I, I keep coming back to this issue that the incentive arguably exists, the, the means exist, so there's a will and there's a way, and the disincentive doesn't exist because it's not tested frequently enough. So it's difficult to look at that as someone, and I, I disclose this openly, someone who's been made cynical by cycling and track and field, and say, well, why would this not exist in football? Sure. I, I, would, I would suggest that in, in men's football, you have... For every uh, category one academy, there are um, 50 kids at seven that are already really fast. They've already been um, sieved out by that stage for each of the of those level clubs. And that works at seven, at then eight, at that nine. So throughout the whole club, there are already, there are already 600 players ready to feed into the senior system. And they're all athletic. And in girls football... If you went, if you start from the recruitment, uh, probably nine that might be loosely associated with the club, there might be one relatively fast kid in that class in that in that year, um, and so it, the whole club might have ten relatively fast girls. If you can take a, a, a relatively uh, easily digestible, easily accessible performance enhancing drug of um, something that will help change the um, body composition which will they will lose a little bit of fat and get a little bit quicker because they're lighter and they've got more active metabolic tissue um mm-hmm. that makes it easier to to cheat if that's what if that makes sense so the things to cheat for a for a male is harder because they're already at a higher level and for a girl it's much easier nick any thoughts yeah. on that no i just I, i'm, I'm so, i think we we have got a, a large degree of consensus and that we i think we do agree that you know as ross listed i mean simon asked the question 
what performance enhancing drugs will help a footballer and we come to epo we come to blood boost blood boosters including epo we get various corticosteroids uh, things that improve your vo2 max so there are there are and we've even talked about how you know the intensity of the season and the training regime itself does almost lend itself to doping in football so so on the one hand we all accept that there are benefits to specific drugs to footballers and we accept that there are footballers doping i think we all accept that i also think the lower league argument from the data seems to bear it out because we had 63 percent of the, the cases were punished so on the face of it if we take the data that we had that i detailed earlier on the face of it it seems to be common or lower down although i don't necessarily think that negates that it could benefit higher up none of us are suggesting that football is rife with doping but absolutely it does benefit footballers and we can go through all sorts of cases you know, of known cases where it's happened, whether that's, you know, in the 80s or the 90s or 2000 or currently players who are banned for doping, including in England. I mean, Manchester United have a convicted doper, you know, in the form of Fred. Uh, very little was made about that when Manchester United signed Fred, but Fred had served a doping ban, um, you know, when they signed him. Um, so I think, you know, we generally agree, but I think we also agree that there's probably more exploration to be done and and that um and that the authorities who aren't really incentivized to catch dopers could probably do more if they really wanted to catch them so any final thoughts before we finish with ross no agree completely ross uh final thoughts yeah i, I think a very constructive and positive discussion yeah. um there's no doubt in my mind from the last decade that investigation is the way forward, not not testing. So if anyone listens to this and, and really has an appetite, they would invest heavily in actually finding out what's going on and not allowing the sort of veil of secrecy that kept cycling back for so long from from affecting football further. So I, I think the more it's discussed, the better. And I, and I probably find myself lying somewhere between doping is not an issue in football because I, I think physiologically clearly it, it would be beneficial and on the other extreme is they're all at it and the answer is likely to be considerably more nuanced and i think this discussion captured that so thank you yeah appreciate it anyone um and thanks for all your t thanks for your time too so yeah if anyone wants to catch go and visit nick's um twitter feed and definitely sport and intelligence and also the science of sport podcast and now uh, you can listen to Scion Fatigue Index or Under Pressure. Appreciate your time. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.